I have known Eleanor for about 30 years, and it was Jeannie, who lived with Eleanor, that introduced Eleanor to our family. It was Eleanor, Jeannie, and Mum who would go driving together every weekend with Eleanor at the wheel. Then it became Eleanor and Mum, with my sister and I sometimes joining. Anywhere my mom needed to go, Eleanor was there to drive her. Eleanor was so into driving that sometimes she would turn off her hearing aid because we were annoying her or distracting her while she drove. And even though she would turn off her hearing aid, she would rather there be people in the car than her driving alone. Eleanor would drive mom everywhere, and Ancaster was their getaway weekend. Whenever I saw Eleanor, it was because she and mom were either going or coming back from somewhere. And for Eleanor, driving was one of the most important things in her life. It was so important that after her knee surgery, she was up every day using the stairs to the upstairs apartments to do her exercises. One day I came in and I saw her doing her exercises at the, and her robe was not belted. And her tenant happened to just come by at the same time. I ended up holding her robe closed while Jason passed and I let her just continued exercising without a care in the world. I bring up Eleanor's exercising because her doctor, Diana, was so impressed with Eleanor's rec quick recovery. And the reason she was re recovering so quickly was so she could be back on the road driving. And after six weeks, when I came to visit, she was ready. She had her jacket on, her shoes, her bag, and she was just ready to go. And when she was driving that day, I can honestly tell you that I've never seen her so happy. And she did not want that journey to end. One of the other things Eleanor loved was animals. She made regular donations to the SBCA and the Toronto Humane Society. And when I was looking at some of her photos, there were photos of a very young Eleanor with a small black dog. And when I met her, she had a, a cat who she greatly loved. But when, she, when the cat died, she was devastated and she couldn't have another one. So she just, instead, she decided to adopt our cats. So whenever she came over, the cats knew they were going to be spoiled. And we figured out that sometimes she would come to visit to talk to us for a little bit, but really just to hang out with the cats. There were other things that were important to Eleanor, too, and one of them was her family. Though she didn't have any immediate family, she would visit her cousins in Ancaster, and whenever she could sneak, in a, sneak it in, she would drive past where her cousin's daughter, Jane, would live, and would always try to point it out. Another thing that was important to Eleanor was the monarch, or the royal family. Any time there was anyone from the royal family in the news, she made sure to, that we all knew. Even though Eleanor, like many of us, watched the royal wedding, it was actually Queen Elizabeth and then Prince Philip that were her favorites. And Eleanor truly enjoyed the Queen's Jubilee. One of the things that I really appreciate about Eleanor is that she always asked after people. When my mother could no longer drive with her, Eleanor always asked how my mother was doing. She always asked how my sister was doing. And she would always say, how are you today? But Eleanor seemed surprised whenever I would stop and say, and how are you doing today? She would give a small chuckle, a sigh, and say she was pretty good. There were a lot of people there for Eleanor in big ways and in small ways. And Eleanor appreciated them all. When I first met Eleanor, it was Jeannie, and then it became my mom. More recently, Eleanor was appreciative when Jason would bring up her laundry, when Diana would do house calls, when Monica would come visit and help her out, and she was so happy when both Marnie and Jane would come and visit her too. Sometimes she didn't understand why people were there for her, and sometimes she didn't think she deserved it. The day before she passed, we were talking. And I reminded her that she wasn't doing the move to the retirement home alone. And that she would always have people there for her. And she asked me, well, why? And I told her, because we loved her. Now, 
Now, this is a little different. We all know that Eleanor stopped driving about a month ago because it took the right person telling her not to drive anymore. But if Eleanor didn't want to do something, she became a little feisty. It may surprise you, but it's true. If Eleanor didn't want to do something, she would change the subject. She would tell you to go do it yourself if you wanted to. But most often, she just pretended she didn't hear you. And when you wrote it down, she would read it and toss it over to the side and then ask you to mail her letters. There was just one other thing that was almost as important as driving to Eleanor. And that was ice cream. She would get two cartons of ice cream each week, specifically vanilla ice cream. And she told me she didn't need a bowl, she just needed a spoon. When she was over for dinner and we had ice cream for dessert, we knew we couldn't talk to her until her ice cream was finished. One time, we all went out for dessert, and her dessert was a bowl of ice cream with four or five scoops of ice cream. We didn't believe that she could finish it, <laughs> but she did, and she was very happy. So now, there are a few things that I'm gonna miss about Eleanor. I miss driving with Eleanor. I miss packing snacks for the family and going to Ancaster. I miss hearing facts and stories behind just about every historical building we would pass. I miss falling asleep in the car and waking up in another town or a city. And Eleanor pretending she can't hear us while we're complaining about it, even while she's trying to hide her chuckle. I miss Eleanor often driving me, offering to drive me to work just because she loved to drive. I miss seeing Eleanor with the cats. I miss making Eleanor and my mom watch action movies while I prepared lunch and dinner. And yes, they did enjoy them. I miss surprising Eleanor with an ice cream stop. I miss the day that I introduced I Eleanor to strawberry sundaes from Dairy Queen. That was what she would, offer, would order from then on. Eleanor was quiet, kind, caring, and loyal. And I miss her. So I'm going to have an ice cream sundae. Thank you. <clears throat> it makes sense that she liked ice cream because she was a sweet lady, wasn't she? And you are what you eat. Um, when I first met Eleanor about, I guess, five and a half years ago when I became the, the priest here, um, she would ask about my cats every time I saw her because we didn't have any kids then. So the, the next sort of thing on the, on the rung for her was, was cats. And, uh, so she, and she had met my cats, and so she would ask how the cats were every time. And then after my mother came to visit one Sunday, after that she would also ask about my mother every time that I saw her. And she used to ask about my father as well, even though she never met him. But uh, that was the nature of how she would express her concern for people, is to sort of ask about the people in your life, you know, about your parents and about your child and about um, you know, your, your spouse and about all the people around you and about your pets. And, and it always struck me that she would always ask that, you know. So much of our time we spend rushing around in this world and people ask us, how are you? And we say, oh, okay, we're okay, you know. But they usually don't ask that follow-up question. They usually don't ask, how are you? And because of that, I always took it as a lesson that, that you know, when I saw her in church, I would always come over to her, right, and, and say hello and shake her hand and let her ask me the questions and then I would respond. Very busy. She's very busy right now. Uh, he's, he's doing really well. He's growing up fast. Um, they're very soft. Uh, you know, I would, I would always answer her question. She was perhaps the most faithful person that I've ever known. If faithfulness is defined as simply showing up, which I think it ought to be. If faithfulness is showing up, Eleanor showed up. And it was not easy for her to do so, because even though she could still drive, it was very uncomfortable for her to walk. I mean, often you'd see, uh, she would try to hide it, but it was obvious that it was actually painful for her to move around. And so she'd take these small little steps, and it would take, you know, 20 minutes to get from that seat there to uh, the, the, the door of the church. And she would do it, not just once on Sundays, but she would do it uh, again on Saturdays as well. She was faithful. We have a little service here we do on Saturdays called the Healing Prayer Service, and usually we get like three, four, five people on a good day to that. And she was somebody who would always come to that. 
In fact, I think that if you were to total up the number of times that she came to that service, it would be a higher number than the number of times that I have come to that service, <laughs> even though I usually lead it or Diana leads it, but one of the two of us. Uh, she was that faithful. She would come. And the strange thing, well, not strange, but interesting thing to me about that is that I'm pretty sure she couldn't hear most of what we talked about. You know, uh, she would kind of tune out a lot of things, even though she would have the hearing things on that we had so she could, she could hear. She would still kind of tune it out. And I think a couple of times I caught her dozing off, but I didn't mind a bit. No doubt her favorite part was when we would lay hands on her and pray for her healing. And she would do that again and again and again. On Sundays as well, when we would offer uh, laying out of hands and, and anointing with Hoyle oil, which we do once a month, she would try to walk from there over to there. And I would come down and meet her before she got very far because, you know, she didn't need to go anywhere. And I said, Eleanor, you can stay. I know that she wanted to stay right there. I'll come to you. But no, she would, she would make the effort because she was faithful. She was faithful. If you were to ask her if she was faithful, I doubt very much that she would think of herself as being so. Uh, she was someone, in fact, I think, who struggled much of her life with self-esteem. I think she's someone who felt that she was unworthy of the love that she received from those around her. And, uh, you know, I think many people in her life tried to convince her otherwise, but that is what she believed about herself. And so she would say things sometimes about how she felt unworthy, and I would try to assure her that she was, in fact, worthy, that she was a child of God, that she was loved, that, you know, all this sort of stuff. But I was never able to get through to her. So when she passed away and uh, we went to her, her house, I was struck by the fact that we found her in a kneeling posture. And um, she was someone who hadn't been able to kneel in, in I don't know, how many decades probably. Uh, and I'm sure that she would have wanted to because she was a very pious person, but she'd never been able to because of her knees. And she was in that posture and she had her head bowed. And I was very moved by this kind of posture of prayerfulness that she, she was in. And it struck me that somehow uh, her, her humility, her, her sort of self-emptying became somehow complete in her passing. And I think that's what God does for us when we pass through the veil of this life. God completes those things that were lacking. So that self-esteem that she had, that's no longer a problem for her. Because she sees God face to face. And she sees herself as God sees her. In a perfect mirror. Loved by the God who made us. Loved just as she is. And no doubt there's a huge pile of ice cream on the banquet table of God waiting for her. And God gives her just a spoon and says, there you go. <laughs> I imagine her now filled with the joy of knowing herself to be loved. That's what complete humility looks like. Being full of God's regard for us. Seeing ourselves as God sees us. For now, those of us left here have only imperfect mirrors. Imperfect mirrors that are sometimes cracked or made dirty by the scuffs of life. We look at them Sometimes their mirrors are other people. Sometimes it's the scripture, which is sometimes difficult to interpret. Sometimes it's the messages that we receive from others or the messages that we give ourselves. And these are imperfect measures of our worth, and they're always imperfect. But there will come a day when we will see perfectly. There will come a day when we will see perfectly the love that God has for us and how perfect we are when we are perfected by God's grace. So... My prayer for you, as you go forth from this place, is to see in your relationship with Eleanor something of a mirror that reflects the love that God has for you. That if you can perceive even a glimmer of the affection that Eleanor had for you in her faithfulness, in the way that she would show up again and again and again, and ask you about your pets or your children or your parents, that in that love and faithfulness, you will see just a glimmer, just a little bit of the kind of love and regard that God has for you and that you will allow yourselves to be transformed, that you will open your heart to receive the love that Eleanor had for you and to see in it a small piece of the love that God has for you and to be perfected in that way. Amen.